Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. I'm hanging out this afternoon, apparently reading some fantastic books. And excited to hang out with a lot of you fun, interesting elements on the internet. But I figured let's go ahead and make it comfortable. Let's uh, enjoy ourselves, a little bit of personal time together, and, uh, you know, get to know a little bit about each other. I've got some fine port here to keep me company, like you do on a Tuesday afternoon at 4 p.m. I poured, I poured a lot in there. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> this is what's called being not the designated driver. Uh, anyway, I'm glad you could join me. We're going to have a good time, hopefully. Um, this is going to be a general hangout, get to know each other type circumstance. So, uh, as far as the types of questions, the quality questions, uh, they can be game related, they can be critical role related, they can be role playing game related, they can be voiceover industry related, they can be just life related, they can be stuff about my history or telling me about your history and just opening conversations about that. Um, you know, I kind of want this to be an open hangout, kind of a whatever you're curious about and then I might ask some curious things back. Um, so yeah, it's just, this is just a hangout. This, this thank you for the robe uh, recommendation. This is, this, is, this is the finest quality I could find for uh, $28 on Amazon. And uh, met my expectations. It is every bit as shitty as I expected. Um, but anyway, welcome, and uh, we'll get a ways into this Q&A, and then maybe we'll go ahead and start creating an NPC and a monster for uh, the campaign a little ways down the road. So, cheers. Oh, that is, that is nice. That is sweet. So, anyway, glad you could join us. Uh, this will be interesting. Let's begin with some, uh, let's fun some fun questions here, if I can remember how to get the pad here open. Possibly, maybe, we'll find out. If I learn technology, if any of you have seen the periscopes, you know, me and technology strangely do not mix very well, but that's okay. Um, all right, so first question I see in there is, where's Larkin? Um, that <laughs> that's a better question for Liam O'Brien. Larkin uh, resides in the same location that Raishan does, which uh, is, as far as everyone knows, very, very deceased. Um, which, by the way, for the record, if you're not caught up in Critical Role, I'm going to try and avoid spoilers, but, you know, some things might squeeze through. My apologies in advance. Did I fix the yard? Uh, I mean, by fix, uh, fix is a relative term. Uh, I got the yard mowed, and then the remnants of the mowing could fill eight or nine of our green bins. So we've been slowly offloading it week after week, and the, our yard in the meantime looks like a series of hills it's terrifying so but we are, are getting it taken care of hopefully all right let's see what questions we got here which is fun uh it is a it is a founder's reserve porto port sandy man and it looks like it has dark man on the cover i know many people say zorro i'm gonna go dark man because that's the kind of person i am if you haven't seen dark man it's awesome the first one don't don't see the rest of them um les nielsen actually the first thing i really knew him from all right, so we'll get to the first uh, first question here at the top. Um, let's see, what's your favorite trope in D and D, or just in general? Uh, what was your favorite storyline besides the Chroma Conclave? This is from uh, Nicosia. Uh, good question. Um, I mean, favorite trope in D and D, I mean, th this was just fantasy tropes in general. And I, I personally, uh, I really like political intrigue. I mean, you know, the fight the monsters and. Stuff is fun, um, but I like the idea of trying to balance that with nations that are warring or crumbling. And uh, there hasn't been a lot of that in this campaign because I can't fit every theme and every trope in every campaign, but I wouldn't be surprised if those elements show up in campaigns down the road. But personally, I, I really enjoy uh, challenges that involve more finesse besides just bursting into doors and defeating creatures. So that's, that's a big fan of mine. As far as uh, previous campaigns that I really enjoyed, um, I mean, I ran the expedition to Castle Ravenloft, and that was an absolute blast. I adored that campaign as I ran it. So that one kind of has a special place in my heart uh, and had some political intrigue, which was fun. Let's see here. What's another fun question? What's my favorite class in D&D &D? by uh, Lai Rohi, which I'm probably butchering that. My apologies. I'm seriously, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Um, I, I've always loved casters. Caster classes were a big thing for me uh, growing up. I love the options of spell casting and um, the utility factor for a party. You know, we, we may not be the most powerful or most survivable 
uh, except for maybe the later levels to get kind of powerful. Uh, it is nice to be able to take care of some of those challenges. The rest of the party is like, I don't know what to do. Uh, I, we're, we're kind of fucked. And you're like, wait, I got a spell for that. You're essentially the clippy uh, paper clip of D&D, &D, and I love that. That was a lot of fun. Uh, let's see here. There's a, a chat. That chat room is moving really fast. So we're cultivating questions from the chat, so don't worry. Even if it goes past, we're, we're keeping an eye out. Um, has the Raishan Trophy mount arrived yet? It has arrived. We haven't opened it yet. We're planning a, uh, a very soon another uh, Christmas. It's been, scheduling's been a pain in the butt. Between completing uh, the book, the campaign guide, general work, and like multiple projects at once, and everyone else's busy schedules, organizing another day to do a Christmas has been a very, very arduous endeavor, but we, we're zeroing down on it soon. So we will have them that soon, and then we'll have all of them, and we might actually be adding them to sets up over here pretty soon as one. So once again, you guys are amazing, and thank you again. Ah, uh, let's see. How surprised was I when Liam killed everyone mid last week from Critter Nation 3000? <laughs> Definitely surprised. Uh, I wasn't expecting him to just throw out, you know, the abyss against a bunch of level one usses uh, that early in. So that was, uh, I, I wasn't sure. I had an inkling he was going to do one of those, you wake up and it, you know, it, you're still okay in another realm or you're out of your sleep type circumstance. But the other party was like, it would also be kind of fitting if he literally brought me in to be a player for the first time in a long time in his game and he just fucking throws uh, Demogorgon at me and kills me in one hit and that's it. And thanks Matt for playing because as much as that sucks on one degree, that shit would be funny. That would be so funny. I'm going to go ahead and adjust this real fast because it's, uh, it's turning off rather quickly on me. So I'm going to go to the, uh, oh, if I can find it because I don't know where it's all organized. Where are the settings on this son of a bird? There it is. I see it. Settings. Pardon me, and I appreciate your patience. Uh, we're going to go ahead and head down to the control center. No. General display. Auto lock in 15 minutes. That'll work fine. All right. Thank you. Pardon me for the slight delay there, friends. I appreciate your patience. All right. Now, if I could pull it up to where I was. There we go. Thank you. I'm going to this support because... Uh, it's that kind of day. Glad you can come and join me. Ah, let's see. Uh, did I, Matt? Did you know that is not a real fireplace behind you from uh, P. Skinner? It's a TV. I I knew that. Um, <laughs> but I appreciate you looking out, uh, and it's it's really sweet of you. And even if it, even if I didn't know, and this was my actual home, and I totally believed it was a fireplace. Would you want to be the one person to tell me that it wasn't? <laughs> like, is that, do you want to be that guy that just kind of, just out of the sake and the necessity to be right, you would tear down the illusion that I built around me? Because you are that guy. Think about that. God damn, that's good. All right. Good call, Ryan. Ryan Green chose the drink of choice and uh, did a fine job. Ah, good question. Uh, Tham Gule. Also, I'm going to butcher all these names, so uh, sorry. And ha. Uh, um, what do I think of the new Mystic class? Uh, I've had a tumultuous relationship with uh, Psionics for a large portion of their D&D &D existence. Uh, I like the idea of psychic-based classes, but the whole, uh, you know, the, the psychic points system has been, I don't know, it always felt like it didn't fit in the rest of the theme of D&D &D for previous editions. I looked at the new Mystic class, and it's got a lot of really cool options. I'm uncertain of it. It seems like a lot of everything in one class. Uh, it kind of feels like, and it's, it definitely has a few options that are extremely overpowered, which is why it's in test, and why you know, the Unearthed Arcana is a really good place to try these things out and get, give feedback, and, and s they can tweak it down the road. I feel like it does feel a bit trying to accomplish everything at once. Uh, so I'd like to see it maybe be a little more fine-tuned into a theme that stood out against the rest of the classes, which is hard because the class is kind of, you know, as a person who's designed and tried to design unique things in the game, it, a lot of bases are already covered. So you really got to stick to a, a, a unique style or, or try your best to at the very least. Um, so I like the idea of the Mystics. I'm not sold on them yet. I'm curious to see after testing if they ever release an official document uh, with a final design and to see how that turns out. So uh, I, I'd like to take a look at it as we go and give some feedback on my own. Maybe I will. Wizards of the Coast. Uh, <laughs> moving on. Uh, let's see. When the uh, question from Elisa Schaefer. 
When starting the campaign, how much did you start with? What level did everyone start at? Um, everyone started at level three at the time. I tend to find that the, I, mean, I could have gone earlier level, but I thought it was just a one shot and I wanted it to be enough of a character ability spread that they had at least a number of options at their disposal. So it was just a level three one shot. This was, the character was originally built in fourth edition actually for that one shot because it was the most kind of button push you know, I just tell you the three abilities you have and how often you can use them and then we play the game. And that's kind of how it came together. But once it became a campaign and we converted over to Pathfinder, we were already at level three and it was fine. And, you know, it just kind of went from there. If you're new to D&D, I highly recommend starting at level one for at least a few games because it's just enough where you can learn the rules without feeling overloaded with options, especially if you're playing a caster. Um, once you've played a game or two or you feel more comfortable, Starting a campaign around level two or halfway through two, which is what I'm doing for the next campaign, I think is good because it doesn't feel like you're having to trudge through that very first level um, if you know the game pretty well and have enough experience. Uh, but also you're not locked into your archetypes for your class. So based on the choices and experiences you have in the first few sessions, that can really inform the direction you want the character to take. So by the time you level up to level three, you've had a few games under your belt and you can make an informed decision on the type of uh, variation of that class you want to pursue. So that's my opinion. Uh, let's see here. Got some more questions. Um, what is my favorite tabletop RPG system? From uh, from Thermivore. Uh, Thermivore. That's fun. It sounds like a. It's like Theramore, which uh, didn't do so well in the lore of World of Warcraft. So uh, I'm glad you changed the pronunciation. Uh, I, I mean, I'm I'm partial to D and D just because it means so much to me as far as just the the genre. I'm a big high fantasy person. It's the first game I ever played. It's the game that I play most often now. Um, you know, it's, uh, and the newer, newer editions have gotten a lot better about weaving narrative and actual gameplay, but I really, I don't know, I really dug the Palladium system, I'm kidding, that's not true, the Palladium system's ridiculous. Um, I like the themes of some of the games, I like, you know, the ridiculousness of rifts, but when you start getting into like 1d4 times 1 million mega damage weapons, it gets a little intense. I, I don't know, <laughs> Ah, I like them all for different reasons. I, unique, unique wise, I really enjoyed the Amber Dyson's role playing game. It was ever the Amber series. It's actually a pretty cool series of books, and it's an RPG that it's, the system is based more upon logistically the the GM logistically considering what succeeds versus what fails based on you know character creation and ingenuity and how you present uh, the challenge and your answer to it. Uh, I thought that was a pretty cool way of doing it. Though the, the randomization of the dice makes things interesting too, so I like that. But Oh, man. I like the Traveler system was fun. The Traveler system was great. One of the few games you can die in character creation, like that in Paranoia. That was a good one. I'm probably going to have to stick with 5th edition right now. I think it's a nice blend of enough rules and numbers and interesting character uh, options that you can still create and customize a character, but still be an easy flow from narrative to combat. Um, it's not perfect. No system is really perfect, and, you know, from my standpoint at least. Um, but it's closest to the kind of system that I would want to play. So I actually like that a lot. Um, let's see. From uh, Zemedelfos, which sounds like uh, something you'd fight in Xenogears. Uh, question, what do you recommend when you have players that it's hard to get all together, but have no good reason for the characters to suddenly pop in and out between sessions? Not many of them are big onto Jaegering another person's character. Uh, that's actually a very good question. And I've had this challenge many times. Uh, there are a couple ways you can do it. If you're... If your party is not terribly locked into having to keep a very, very realistic narrative, and you can introduce somewhat silly kind of suspension of disbelief moments in the game, you can introduce elements like um, the heroes as part of this venture were all cursed or locked to a specific artifact. And at randomized times, it will fold or steal the players into an alternate reality. And so when the players can't be there, all of a sudden the orb claims them and they're not there and they have to wait for them to return. Um, also, having ventures where uh, the planes can be unstable and occasionally individuals fade from one realm to the other with, without given warning, and that can be part of the overall narrative is to stop these planes from crossing. And thus, different party members can just vanish and come back, and it doesn't really affect the narrative flow because you've already established a reason for that being the case. So you can, you can run up more narrative level like that. You can make it like I do, where you just try and, try and come up with a creative reason for them to leave. If you're in the middle of a circumstance, you can just have them kidnapped by a monster, and now part of the adventure is also trying to save them. Um, uh, it's it's the eternal 
challenge. You know, it's 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 not the easy answer for it. So it's easier if you if you're playing more of a tongue in cheek game and you all can lean into it a bit. And there can even be uh, in the same realm like a curse that befit the party and and on certain phases of the moon, you might turn into cardboard. And the players have to fold you and put you in the bag of holding until you're ready to come out again in your full form. Those silly ways make it a lot easier and you can just have fun with it that way. Um, but weaving in a narrative, you can try and find an overarching reason as to why they have to jump in and out occasionally. It's not easy. I don't have a great answer for it, but that's as best as I can give you because that's all I've done in the past. Uh, let's see here. Question from Phantoms Ruin Lives. Uh, any tips on dealing with audition nerves, waiting to hear back on an audition? Yes. Um, audition nerves never go away. I know they're like, oh God, no. I mean, they'll, they'll dwindle over time, but the, those butterflies never go away. In fact, I kind of, you learn to harness them. You learn to use that nervous energy as, as kind of a, a positive thing. Part of that only comes with experience. And another is uh, coming to terms with the fact that you're not there to prove that you're right for the job. They're just seeking whoever is right for the job. And if it happens to be you, it's you. If it's not, it's not. So the pressure isn't to be better than other people. It's to be the best you can be for yourself. And if you're right for that particular role that you audition for, then they'll probably book you. And uh, if not, somebody else is better for it. Doesn't mean they're better than you, but they were better fit for that one character. Um, and trying to keep that mindset over time. It's not a you versus them mentality. You're just doing your very best. And if you don't get it, it's not because you're bad necessarily, it's because you just weren't right for that particular job. And as a director or casting director, you're not just casting people, you're weaving a tapestry. You're having, you know, where, where you're just reading for one character, they have a view of the entire cast, all the characters and archetypes and, and story elements that have to weave together. So they might audition you and other people that are both sound amazing for the roles, but you might sound too similar. And so as, a, as an ensemble, it doesn't work to have you both in these roles that are so close together, and so they might cast somebody else for that. That doesn't mean that you weren't right for the job, or you weren't you know, great for the job, but for the sake of casting the project as a whole, they had to go with something else. But they'll still keep you in mind for stuff down the road. That's another thing, too. Even if you don't book something, if you knock it out of the park in the audition, people will keep you in mind. I can't tell you how many projects that I've read for and didn't book anything, and then a year and a half, two years later, they call me in to read on something or book me on something because they're like, Love you read for that. It wasn't right for the character, but something else came up down the road that we liked you for, and they wanted to have you read on that now, too. So it, it can help you regardless. So don't, don't be too hard on yourself for not booking a gig. The auditioning process is part of the learning and the experience. Also, I recommend don't wait to hear back on an audition. A really healthy mindset when it comes to that process, whether it be voiceover, on camera, everything, is to do your best. You're doing the job in the room. You're doing the best you can, and then once it's done, let it go and move on to the next endeavor. Focus on the next opportunity. Focus on the next class you can take. Focus on the next character you can explore. And just let that audition go. And it may take some time to learn that type of behavior, but you really have to just kind of release it. That way, if it doesn't happen, you've already forgotten about it, and you're already focusing on bigger and better things. If it does happen, that's a fantastic surprise. Um, so that's my recommendation in that regard, too. This is, uh, this is delicious. I will try my best not to get extremely intoxicated. I didn't promise anything. Uh, Ficked Up asks, have I ever LARPed? I have not, like, field character costume LARPed yet, and I haven't because I haven't had time, or because I haven't... I'm scared I'll like it too much. I have a lot of friends that uh, do it, and it's consumed them. It's become, you know, their biggest hobby, and they put all this time energy in the costumes and stuff, and I, I, would, I know I would do that. I know I would, and I... I just have too much stuff going on. Um, I have LARPed Vampire once. Um, I was pulled into a LARP. It was up in Simi Valley in the early 2000s, and it was this huge chapter of a bunch of theater kids from a magnet school, like a theater magnet school that I met through community theater, and they invited me to come be part of this. I had no backstory on it, and I was thrust into a very political figure that was introduced by the prince of that whole area as his new right-hand man, so I became this political intrigue focus for the evening with no backstory and no idea of how the political dynamics worked, and I was kind of thrown to the wolves, if you will. And there were wolves there, or werewolves anyway. Um, and so it wasn't the best experience. It was unique. It was different. But I kind of was out of my element there and got spooked off a bit from that. I still had a good time, but uh, yeah. If I had another chance, I'd want to... I know I know what to ask for as far as research and background and stuff to actually fit in. Um, I think it's awesome. I, I, I did run a show for a while called Adventure 
uh, stage show that my friend Coleman uh, ran, and Marish was part of it, and Bonnie Gordon, who you've seen her here a few times, she was part of it. Xander came and played a number of times. Uh, our fantastic, what's up? Yep, Talison was in it with us. Um, uh, Courtney, our uh, fantastic alpha mistress over there, she uh, came and was part of it many times. We, it was just a live role play kind of stage show where we pulled members from the audience as PCs and we'd pull them through a storyline where we were the NPCs changing costumes behind the scenes and going from sequence to sequence. It was a lot of fun. Um, so I guess that's the closest thing I've done to LARPing. But once again, always NPCs. Always the DM. It's fine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and start our first poll. Let's start getting some of our fun, uh, fun character design stuff going here. So let's go ahead and begin with the uh, the NPC on this one. So I'm gonna keep making tabs. How it's gonna work? Is I'm gonna start asking for some suggestions from the chat and keeping an eye out when I ask for a certain thing. And then um, I'll pick a few. We'll throw them into a straw poll. That straw poll will be up for about a minute, minute and a half. So you'll rush in once the link's available in the chat. Vote, and then when that time is up, we'll call it. And that's what we're going with for that aspect of the NPC. So, first and foremost, uh, let's pick a uh, let's pick a race for the NPC. So if you wanna go ahead and type into the chat here what, what race you think it should be. Uh, we're talking if it's human, halfling, uh, tiefling, half-orc, a lot, anything you wanna just type them in there. I'm gonna pay attention for a second to see uh, how, what seems to be popping up more often than not. Oh, that's a lot. That's a wall. Oh, my, I can see forever. Uh, seeing a lot of half work. We'll put half work on there. That'll be one of them. Um, all right, we're passing by. There's a lot of, a lot of human, human. That's me. And a lot of drow. Huh. That'll be interesting too. Hmm. You guys haven't seen much drow in Taldore. Hmm. They're there, which you'll see in the campaign guide. Um, and. Dragonborn. So that's four, and we'll do one more. Looking through here. Genasi. A lot of Genasi. All right. Going some unique classes there, and a little human thrown in just for some averageness. All right. So uh, I believe that is Drow, Half Orc, uh, Genasi, Human, and what else was it? Half Orc, Human, Drow, Dragonborn, Genasi. Dragonborn, Genasi. All right, cool. So we're going to go ahead and get that uh, situated for you guys here in just a moment. We'll have the voting start for that race. We'll have about two minutes, and then we'll come back with an answer, and that will set in the race for the NPC. It's kind of fun, communal construction. I've never done it like this. It's going to be fun. So uh, once that straw poll is done, the uh, link will be in the chat, and uh, go ahead and vote. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and answer another question here. Hmm. George Fletcher asks, what is your favorite kind of cheese? Hmm. So I like these questions. I like these like strange, non-game-related two ones, pepper it through, interesting, weird tidbits of things you've ever all, ever wondered about why I'm such a weird person. Because I'm a very weird person. Um, favorite type of cheese? I really like uh, smoked goudas. Um, I've actually recently gotten really a fan of, of extra aged gouda. It has like a slight kind of caramel-ish, like little almost crunchy crystals in it. Uh, that with like some pita chips and some wine is good or some honey. That, would I pair with what? Your would I pair with my current drink? What I? I have no idea. I am. I am not. I am not a wine and cheese snob. I know. I know so little. I. I am really good at trying to. I'm mean, actually no. I'm really bad at trying to fake like I'm a cultured person, because I don't know. I mean, have you seen my dragon socks? Okay, <laughs> like I am. I am not at all a cultured person. Uh, for this, honestly, probably s'mores. <laughs> It's a very sweet port, so I'd go more of a s'mores. It's not cheese, but deal with it. That's my answer. Anyway, um, next question. Let's see here. Uh, from uh, Gal Galistan. Question. Hey, Matt, thanks for being my lifelong inspiration. I'm planning to break into the VO industry and currently taking voice acting lessons. Is there anything else that you recommend doing to get an edge in an admittedly cutthroat industry? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, cold reading training. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Um, training, to, you know, and classic forms of, of acting and performance is so important. Being comfortable and experienced enough to where you can jump into a scene and just make confident choices, not worrying if they're the right choices, but whatever feels natural. That's the thing, too. A lot of people get caught up in their head about, am I making the right decisions? Am I making the right impulses? Am I feeling this out correctly? As long as you're making some choice, you're doing it right, because you're, you're going with your instincts, and it's taking you there. And if it's not the right direction, 
the director, who is their job, will guide you back on track. But they much prefer to have somebody who's bold in their choices and, and, and commits to the path they take as opposed to somebody who's unable to decide which path they want to go with a character to choice. So that's big. But for voiceover in particular, read out loud, whatever. Don't even look at it. Like get a script or get a book, throw it in front of you and just start reading out loud as you read it for the first time because that's most of the job. You want to take scripts and learn to cold read. Most of the job is cold reading. Rarely do you get a script in advance for a project. And most of the time, you kind of just walk into the booth and there's, you're around soundproofing by yourself with a glass window and a director and multiple other people in the room looking at you through it going, okay, um, go. And you have to go. And uh, that's, that's the job. So cold reading, learning to be comfortable to read things spontaneously as you receive them out loud. Uh, listen back, record yourself doing it and listen and you, know, you can self-critique and work on your enunciation, work on understanding the flow of uh, dialogue, and don't be afraid to take beats. A lot of people, especially when they begin, they just read everything through. But characters breathe. They have thoughts mid-sentence. They stammer. So another thing, too, is breathing life into a scene as a character. Consider what action they're taking during it. If you read a scene where a person's in a kitchen and you just read the dialogue as, well, yeah, of course, but if we're going to go on a vacation, the least we can do is try and bring the family. Or think about them doing the dishes and be like, well, of course. I mean, if we're going to go on vacation, you know, we might as well bring the family, you know, suddenly, even if it's just audio, you imagine that person doing a physical activity. You immediately envision a part of the, uh, part of the kitchen that wasn't there before. So think of the character, think of beats, moments, exerts, things that can breathe life into their physicality, even though you're just reading their voice out loud. Um, and so those are good things to keep in mind as you're learning a scene or playing out a character. Um, and if it's not the right choice, the director, once again, will correct you, but rather have you making choices than not. Uh, all right, so do we have an answer on the straw poll? Drow by 60%. Oh, oh, oh. oh, man. We might be getting some story on the rune shock soon. You don't know what that is. You will in August. Um, all right. So the NPC race is drow. We have a drow NPC. We are off to the races. Okay. So now that we have a drow NPC, um, I want to think of what occupation that drow has. Uh, that can be a character class, or it can be a position, like a politician, or a guildmaster, or an artisan, or a cutthroat, or a mastermind, or whatever you think uh, an occupation for this N NPC would be good for them. Spy is a good one. I see. Sp okay, we'll, we'll look at this for a second. We'll see what comes through. All right. I'll get some different ones here. I see. I, <laughs> I see a lot of warlock. We'll put warlock on there. I see a lot of baker. There's a lot of bakers in there. It's a big spread. Warlock, baker. Um, okay. Let's see here. I see a lot of. See a lot of prince. A lot of prince. They want some royalty, some sort of royal or noble blood involved in there. That'll be interesting. Um. <laughs> You guys are ridiculous. You're ridiculous. Um, bounty hunters come up quite a bit. That's a fun one. Uh, okay, and we'll go for a last one. Go for a last one here. Oh my God, it's it's like looking into the matrix. It's just. Uh, there's a lot of prostitute, which is rad because sex trades a. Awesome, legitimate form of business for a lot of good people. So, prostitutes on there. So, what, are, what is the listing we have? Warlock, baker, royalty, bounty hunter, and prostitute. Warlock, baker, royalty, bounty hunter, prostitute. All right, we're going to go ahead and get that straw poll going here in just a minute. And uh, take a, a minute or two to go ahead and vote, and we'll see, we'll see where this takes us. This should be very unique. <laughs> okay, then. So... Back to the next question here. Let's see. Bap, 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 bap. All right. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Arthur Dent asks a question. How do you set magical item prices? <laughs> this is a good question. Um, there is a, in the DMG, uh, in the magical item treasure section, early into it, there is a, a table that gives you the general kind of price range for items by rarity. So you go from common, uncommon, rare, very rare, and legendary. 
um, and it gives you like 500 gold to 5,000 gold, 5,000 gold to 50,000 gold. Yeah, it doesn't really help a lot. So it kind of comes with understanding power levels in the game. And so if it's a very rare item, but it's pretty damn powerful, very rare item, I'm like, damn, that's a good, very rare item with a lot of abilities. I'll probably set that a little higher up. I'll be like, all right, well, if it's like a 5,000 to 50,000, that's a really powerful item, I'll set it at 40 to 45,000 gold. And if they want to, you know, pursue whoever, uh, or uh, persuade whoever's selling it down a little bit, maybe. Um, if it's uh, an, an uncommon, which is pretty, pretty low, I think it's like uh, 50 to 500, and it's a pretty easy and minimal, like a Tanglefoot bag or something like that, I'll probably set it at about 50, 60 gold tops, you know, nothing too big. But a lot of it is improvising it based on the range that's in the, uh, the GM's guide and the power level, how I understand it. Doesn't mean that it's, you know, it's right or wrong, but as a GM, you get to set those just based on your experience. And it's okay if you mess it up a little from what you, you're considered, but the players won't know any better. And it's your world you set the prices. Um, I'd recommend you writing them down. And remember, prices can change from person to person. Prices aren't the same everywhere. An item might be really uh, common in one town and really uncommon in another across the continent. So the prices might be jacked up in those various places. Um, but yeah, it's a combination of improvising based on what I can ascertain of the item's power level, uh, along with the, uh, the range they give in the DMG. I hope that's helpful. Uh, let's see. Oh, question from Niche asks, are you surprised by what some of Vox Machina has decided much to do in this past year? Yes, actually. Uh, and I'm excited. We, we actually got together last night and went through what everyone wanted to accomplish, did some roles. It was kind of a throwback to our early days playing at home in some ways. It wasn't like a full session or anything, but they'd, you know, for things they wanted to accomplish, there were roles to see if the challenge succeeded or not. Um, uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to begin the session on Thursday, going through those lists, discussing what happened, and possibly playing out a few scenes that involve what they're hoping to accomplish. So that's going to be, uh, that's going to be what Thursday begins with. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting. There's some interesting choices. Uh, Grog has one thing in particular that the players don't know about that's going to be real. Interesting. Grog's such a terrible person. Um, okay, so are we about good to close that straw poll? Baker is in. Baker is <laughs> Drow Baker. We have a Drow Baker. That's, that's going to be awesome. I am excited about this. Oh, someone asked here, uh, Built Too Fast says, is Blood Hunter being added into your campaign? Uh, there was a Blood Hunter NPC, and the Blood Hunter uh, orders are part of the Tau, or the part of the Exandria lore. They mostly stem from Wildmount, but yes, there there is uh, called the Clare orders uh, within Exandria. They haven't come into or okay, within Tal'Dorei. They haven't come prominently into the story. I don't know if they will. We'll see how that plays out. But they are part of uh, Tal'Dorei. Um, all right. So uh, next question, and then we'll get back to the next bit for the NPC. Let's see here. Um, uh, Surays asks question about life. You always try to be positive and down to earth. How do you do it? <laughs> I, I don't always succeed. Um, I don't know. It's that's interesting. Uh, that's a weird question. Um, I don't know. Just just be be empathic. Be willing to make mistakes um, and own up to them. Learn from them, and. No matter how much a person frustrates you, no matter how much a person makes you angry or tries to, to hurt you, maintain a point of perspective that you don't understand what they've gone through to get them there, what their, what their day was leading up to that moment, what abuses they've undergone, what difficulties, challenges, and, and, and you know failures they're ruminating on at that time, and you've become an outlet for it. That's not always the case. I don't think... I'll, there are bad people in the world, by all means, and I do understand that, but I think a lot of dissonance stems from people's inability to imagine what the other side of this might be. And so allowing yourself that expansion to be able to give people the benefit of the doubt and think, I know what they said is really terrible, but maybe they are having a really terrible day, a really terrible week, a very terrible month. Maybe they lost a friend, lost a family member, and they're just lashing out. You don't know. And that perspective makes it a lot easier to kind of not take things to heart and step away. And that opens empathy for others. Um, and that even just goes for everyday uh, you know, encounters. When you stop at a gas station to order gas, make eye contact with the, uh, the attendant and ask them how their day's been. It's amazing how quickly you'll see people open up and smile when you engage them as a human being and not as just part of a transaction. Um, and I recommend you try that. 
on a day-to-day -day basis because it just, I don't know, it, it, it makes every day that much more lively. It, it makes you really appreciate how so many different backgrounds, how many different people who all have their own story, their own trials and tribulations, and they all come together to make this beautiful world that we all live in. Um, so good days and bad days. We're all human beings and we're all trying to be happy and keep that in mind. That, that helps. It's helped me so far. So far. Uh, <laughs> all right, we're now getting to the, um, the next aspect of the NPC's design here. Um, so they are a drow baker, according to chat's design. Um, uh, what, is, what is their interest in Vox Machina? Uh, which, if there are any members of Vox Machina on the soundstage, they should be leaving right now because we're getting into narrative elements. Hi. Talus and Jaffe. Hi. I'm going now. You have pretty eyes. You have pretty eyes. He does have really pretty eyes. He has really pretty eyes. That got weird. Um, or did it? All right, so their interest, uh, the baker's interest in Vox Machina. So we have, all right, well, it's just Grog has been put in a bunch. I don't know, so it's just an interest in Grog. Uh, so I can expand upon that if that should win. So we have Grog as one option. Uh, let's see. People here are throwing out, uh, <laughs> People are throwing out wedding. People are throwing out a wedding. Uh, so we'll put that in there. Uh, vengeance. Vengeance is always a fun one and a nice change up from the previous suggestions you've given. Uh, let's see. Hmm. This is a lot here. I know, I know this is a rough process, guys. We're all figuring this out as we go, but we're trying the best we can. Um... Okay, so I mean, I'm, we're getting a lot of, of repeating ones here that we've already said. Uh, okay, fanboy, I've seen come up quite a few times. We'll go with that. And the last one will be bring Terry home. That's interesting. All right, all right. So we got what? What, what, what is it again? It's Grog, wedding, vengeance, fanboy, bring Terry home. Those are the five choices. We're gonna throw those up in the chat on the straw poll. Go ahead and take a minute or two to get your votes in, and we'll see which one of those comes out on top. This is a very interesting process. <laughs> uh, people saying mic is low. I don't know if that's the case or if it's just their screen. But uh, if it's just your just your computer, too bad. Turn up your volume. Uh, all right, so, next question. Pineapples on pizza, yay or nay? Eh, I made a third option. I've had it, and it's all right. Not my preference. I wouldn't in, go out of my way to order pineapples on pizza, but if pineapples show up on pizza, and it's the only pizza there, I'm not going to be like, I will not eat you. I'll go, all right, and I'll eat it. So, I'm in, I'm in between. Not meant to be a cop-out. Literally, that is my answer. I hope that was helpful. Um, uh, that, that was from uh, Kid Cross, by the way. Thank you, Kid. Ross Reynolds asks, how do you balance your major part and critical role in your career as a voice actor? <laughs> I'm still figuring it out. Oh, thank you. You're welcome, sir. Wondrous. Oh, look at this delivery system. It's glor glorious. The robe made me Gilmore suddenly. I don't know why. <laughs> mm. I'm going to have some more of that port. This isn't a bad way to spend a Tuesday afternoon with you guys. Thanks for chilling with me. This is good. All right. So, how do I balance critical old being a voice actor? I don't know yet. <laughs> I'm still working on it. Um, when, you, when you live a career for long enough that could end tomorrow, and you don't know where your next paycheck's coming from, and it's a passion, and you're doing odd jobs to make rent, um, doing temp work, doing data entry at environmental agencies or stocking warehouses, you learn to say yes to everything. It's just, it's, it's the idea that whenever opportunity arises, you seize it. Um, I, I feel very fortunate that in recent years, because of all the hard work and because of shows like Critical Role, that I've had a lot of more opportunities arise. I've probably said yes to a lot of things I shouldn't have. And in doing so, it's consumed most of my free time and it's driving me a little crazy. Um, but I'm learning that balance. Uh, both me and Marisha are kind of each other's uh, support in both of our lives getting a little crazy and trying to 
make sure we allow time for self-care and spending time together and carving out time for the people that are closest to us. So part of the reason Critical Role is so important to us isn't just the show, but honestly, it's, it's a chance every week for us to get to hang out with some of our favorite people that we don't have the time to most of the other days of the week or month. So um, it's I'm still something I'm working on. I have a lot of projects on my plate right now. Finishing the campaign guide is gonna, gonna be a big weight off my chest. Um, we're in the final throes of it right now. Really excited for you, I hope you guys like it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm learning that process now. I'm, a, I'm notoriously uh, work myself to death. I tend to take on too much and try and get it done and it's not the healthiest thing, so I'm working on it. So my answer is, I don't know, <laughs> I'm still trying. I'll let you know in a year if I figure out the secret. Otherwise, I don't know. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Per like the fruit asks, is there some NPC in particular or some type of NPC you've been itching to introduce but the moment never presented itself? Yeah, there's a few NPCs that I've created that never had a chance to show up. Um, but I'm not going to tell you because any NPC that doesn't get a chance and any, NPC, any DM or GM will tell you this, an NPC that you like that doesn't have the opportunity to shine or show up just goes back in the toolbox for later. So, they'll come back eventually, I'm sure. They'll come back. They'll come back. Trust me. Um, uh, Torch Barricane asks, what's my favorite type of cookie? Uh, that'd be ginger snap. Ginger snaps are awesome because they're not loaded down with too much sweetness, but it's got the right amount of like cinnamon spice. I like things that are like sweet and spicy. So uh, ginger snap's pretty great. Yeah, I'll go with that. Um, Let's, let's go with the next NPC choice, since we got that locked in now. We did a couple questions there. This is so delightfully chaotic. I, I apologize. Uh, but thank you for sticking with me on this. All right, so what is the answer? Bring Terry home. Bring Terry home. <laughs> oh, man. This is going to be fun. All right, cool. Got that in there. And uh, the second to last thing I'm going to ask about this NPC is they have a secret. There is something that this NPC is keeping a secret that may or may not unfold in the game. We don't know, but you'll know, and I'll know. Um, but what is what is this NPC secret? Go ahead and introduce into the chat room what your ideas are. Keep them kind of concise if you can. Um, so we'll, we'll get that worked out. So go ahead and put it into the chat room, and we'll pull some out as they go. <laughs> okay. Um, they're a drow. That's not a very good secret. They're not keeping it very well unless they're an illusion. I mean, it's possible. Um, hmm. Hmm. There's a lot of interesting here. Let's try. Okay, he's revenant. That's an interesting one. I'm trying to pick things that'll that might work into the next campaign. I don't want to pick anything that'll like wreck it or the storyline that I have worked out in my head. So I'm having to cherry pick a little bit for this one. Um, hmm, secretly a paladin. That's interesting. Can play with that. Uh, <laughs> put Ziggurat on there. Just Ziggurat. Um, he's a hitman. And oh man. This is so nuts. Well, that's interesting. He's blind. There we go. There's some interesting ones there. Some fun little things that can be utilized. Some of these, some of these secrets you guys put on there might roll into other things that were already mentioned. We'll see how that plays out. So, reading us back, what do we have? Revenant, secretly a paladin, Ziggurat, oh, was the other ones? Hitman, Hitman he's or he's blind. Okay, so we're going to throw that up uh, onto the, 
the chat in just a moment to go ahead and get that straw poll going, and we'll see which one of those wins out to be the NPC's secret. That'll be interesting. Blind is not exactly a secret, you say. However, if you, uh, with the right magic, can keep it a secret. I have ideas. I have ideas. Don't worry. I can play with this. Um, all right, cool. Okay, J Red Wine says, how'd you get into Burning Man? <laughs> um, my acting, co I was, in about 2008 or so, I was, I was kind of a bit of a rough patch. You know, losing my faith in humanity and the arts in a lot of ways. I was just in a, I was in a rough period. Uh, and just self-esteem and personal stuff. And my acting coach at the time, uh, who hilariously is uh, Talison's mom, Kether, uh, she had been going for many years, and she said, you, you would enjoy this, and you should go. This would be a good thing for you. And I was like, I don't know, I'm not, in, I'm not into the whole hippie drug culture, because I had my thoughts of what the event was. Um, and she's like, it's not like that. I mean, it is like that in some ways, but not really. Like, All right, fine, I'll go. So I made a lot of excuses. She didn't let me adhere to them, and uh, eventually went. And it was a lot more than I expected. It's certainly not for everybody. It's a harsh environment. Um, it's a very kind of open culture of all walks of life, cultures, sexualities, expressions. Uh, a lot of people there just walk nude. Uh, it's a lot of art, hippy dippy stuff that a lot of people probably couldn't even deal with or would hate entirely. But uh, for me, uh, it was a wonderful environment of adults at play for a week. And I really, really enjoyed it. And it became a very important part of my life. So I, I, I go every year, it's my kind of my, my cleansing, my reset button, my creative uh, need to return to the, the default world. And uh, so I, I've met a few critters out there who are burners as well, they've come by. Uh, Operator is a nice guy if you're watching. Uh, Operator, hopefully see you there soon. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, not, it's definitely not for everybody. It's hard to get there, it's hard to survive out there. It's a harsh desert made of high alkali, playa powder. Um, electronics die out there, it's hot. Um, you have to bring your bring everything in to survive and then bring it out. Um, but if you're ready to make the make the journey there, uh, and if you're of that artistic mindset, uh, it can be a really really cool experience. Anyway, uh, do we have an answer on that straw poll? Ziggurat. Ziggurat. <laughs> okay then. I think we have a pretty solid background on this NPC and where they can come into play. I'm excited about this prospect. The last thing we need is a name. Um, I want to see you guys throw out some cool names. I'll pick out things that reach me, uh, and we'll, we'll vote on which one we want the NPC name to be. So uh, go ahead and throw your suggestions in the chat room for what the name of this drow baker may be. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> no. Nope. Nope. It, I, I know you guys want to be funny and cute. I want to try and make this also work within the story where it can be taken seriously because certain names will not be taken seriously if they're introduced in this game. Uh, Troy is definitely one of them. Uh, <laughs> all right, we'll start with uh, Rubric. That's interesting. Miklos, M-I-K-L-O-S. Uh, let's do... Oh man, there was a good one and it passed by too fast. Zal's, oh man, it went by too fast. God, curse you, chat for being active. No, you guys are doing great, but I, I need to. Uh, let's see here. I found one that's behind. Damn it. Okay. Let's do Korean. K apostrophe R Y Y N. Noxtra. N O X T R A. Is that four? That's five. That's five? All right. So we'll go ahead and throw those into the straw poll. And uh, you guys go ahead and jump in there and vote on the name. And then from those names, we'll, we'll, we'll pick those. Uh, and from there, we'll have an NPC pretty much completed that you guys uh, helped create. Uh, will be introduced probably in this next arc of the game. So that'll, that'll be interesting. I'm excited to see what comes out of this one. <laughs> Alrighty. So with that, I'm going to go have another sip of my drink. R.I.P. Troy. Ah, 
it's cute. It was a really funny idea, guys. Um, but in the interest of wanting to keep the narrative realistic and because Troy is good friends with a lot of us, that would made it a little weird. Um, let's see here. Question from Action Gordon. Bees, yes or no? If yes, how many? Bees, yes. Uh, how many? Seven. I think bees are awesome. <laughs> bees are great. They're necessary. They're, we have a lot of bees in our backyard. They're cute. They land on me sometimes. And, you know, people get freaked, freaked out about bees. That's fine. I mean, then like honeybees. Fuck hornets. And yellow jackets. I hate them. But bees are cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, question from uh, Little526. Have you ever had a moment where you almost gave up being a DM entirely? Uh... I'm giving up a DM entirely, giving up on a campaign almost. Actually, at the start of our, uh, the campaign I did before this one, uh, with my buddy Zach Hanks, we were both co-DMing this one. And uh, we had uh, a number of friends in there, Louis, uh, our buddy Brian, who looked like a dwarf and played a dwarf, uh, and Chloe Dykstra, some of you may know from uh, some of her stuff, she played uh, Saga, the rogue, and then uh, Marisha came in eventually to be an assassin. Uh, but in that campaign, the first couple sessions, we had a guy and his wife that were playing with us who made a, uh, uh, they made a, a twins. He was a paladin, I think she was a, a cleric. And he just kept, our first two sessions, he just got really drunk very quickly and became unruly. He became belligerent and was interrupting everybody else and making sexual jokes in the middle of other people's turns and turn it into a him show and it was not very respectful. And he's a nice guy, but just once he got drunk, it was a problem. And so uh, after two games of that happening, and the final one, we were in the middle of a boss battle sequence and a very like serious centered moment, and he like was yelling and, and making stupid jokes and fart noises and talking about how he was going to attack with his dick, and it wasn't even his turn. And I was like, all right, buddy, calm down. And I could see his wife was kind of embarrassed by it, and I was like, sorry, sorry. And then finally... During somebody else's turn, he jumped up and shouted something obscene. I can't even remember. Knocked his beer over all over the battle map and like smeared all the all the the crowd. So I said, "All right." So the wall begins to collapse uh, of the ceiling, and unfortunately, a portion of the uh, the cavern was in your direction as both of your characters are crushed uh, as you escape. And I, I killed off their characters, and I apologized to her after, but I was like, "I don't think this is gonna fit." And he, she was like, "I understand. No worries." And so he stopped playing in the campaign. He felt bad about it, um, but uh. Uh, yeah, it was for the best. And uh, he's a great guy now. He's, his name's Andrew. He's a really, really nice fella. Um, but we're just, our styles of gameplay didn't quite match. And that's fine. That's the thing, too. Like, many people, there's so many different ways to play d and I mean, Even Critical Role, uh, and uh, actually, I want to talk about this a little bit. People keep saying, Critical Role, it's, it's the best example there is for d and I'm like, it's not. It's really not. It's an example of d and It's a way to play the game. Uh, it's a way that we play, because we're actors, and as actors, we're naturally more focused on narrative and characterization and the drama of the element there, you know, it's, it's, it tends to, our version of D&D plays more to the story than it does the, the rules, per se, as you can see, as the, some of the players haven't locked in all the rules sometimes, um, it's because we're more focused on other aspects of the game, and that's fine, we still have a good time, but we're an example of how it can play. Um, and there are piece, there are elements of our game that you might like and take into your home campaign, and there are a lot of people that watch it that if they were to play in it would probably not enjoy it at all. And there are a lot of people, <laughs> trust me, I've seen comments, I've been tweeted, people saying like, your game looks like shit, I would never enjoy it. And I'm like, you're probably right. And, and there are games out there that people play that I probably wouldn't enjoy either. Um, but that's what's cool about it, is there's so many different ways to play it, there's so many different ways you can run it for the players, and all those styles uh, are enjoyable for players that are looking for that type of experience. Um, so, so yeah, that's an example of Andrew would be great at a table, like a, like a, uh, you know, a Harmontown type ridiculous drunkard debauchery table. He'd do great there. For those of us that were paying a little more respect to the narrative and the, the, the intensity of a sequence, it didn't quite match up very well. And you just kind of both respectfully talk and go, all right, guys, this isn't, this isn't going to work out. And that's fine. Um, so keep that in mind. And also, for all you guys who are new to D&D, uh, don't expect a critical role experience at your table. Uh, partially because, once again, we're professional actors and we've been playing this for a long time before we started the stream. When we first started playing our first few games, it was nothing like this. It was a lot of fumbling and, well, I don't know, let's go, what do I do? You know, because they were all just learning how to play. Um, 
And some games are a little more rules heavy, a little more, you know, the game the gamers and the DM are more involved in the actual game aspect of it. And that's rad. And I've had a lot of sessions like that before. They've been a lot of fun too, but you want to make sure you establish those boundaries and, you know, adjust your expectations. Every game table is going to be different. Every experience you have at the table is going to be different from what you've seen in my or, you know, the role play guys or Acquisitions Inc. or High Rollers or any other great show. All of them are different and unique because that's how every table experience is playing. D &D. That's part of what makes it so special. So I just, I ask you guys, you know, don't get angry if your first or second D&D &D game isn't like Critical Role because it can't be. Nor could our game ever be like yours. They're wholly unique in their own right. So just abandon expectation, which by the way is a great term, a great guide for life in general. Abandon expectation. Just try and move forward and do your best. Uh, and that goes for your D&D game as well. So I recommend that. Uh, anyway, uh, do we have a name answer on this one? Okay. Apostrophe R Y Y N. So Kryn the Drow Baker. <laughs> Kryn the Drow Baker. Uh, who has their interest is involving bringing Terry home, and they have a secret that involves a ziggurat of some kind. <laughs> Good to know. All right. Oh, Starry Bright brings up a question. Have I, what do I think about the McElroy bo boys in the show, Adventure Zone? They're phenomenal. They're, uh, they're, it's a great, great show. If you haven't had a chance to see it, the podcast, The Adventure Zone, it's, it's great. Uh, uh, they, they run a D&D game there. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I would say it's a less serious tone than Critical Role, but they have serious moments as well. They have a lot of dramatic moments. It's a podcast form. It's a lot less rules heavy uh, than ours, which is even ours is not as rules heavy as some other games. So like I said, it's a spectrum. Um, but the Adventure Zone's great. Uh, the McElroys are fantastic. Travis is fantastic. We've talked a bit online, and I'm a big fan of what they do. Um, so if you haven't had the opportunity, check it out. I recommend it. They're fantastic. And they also do a great job of representing uh, the importance of community and support Others in the community, uh, they're, they're just generally rad people. So I highly recommend you check it out, too. Um, all right. So let's pick another question here. I'd be curious to see some, some non-D&D related non-voiceover. Like, I kind of want to break this part of a conversation of just random shit also. Because I answer a lot of questions on panels and stuff. So if you have any, like, burning questions about silly things or life things, you know, we can get real. We can get real. I, I'm all for that. If you want to make this kind of almost a harken back to the honesty hour days of the early Twitch stream, like, I'm totally fine with that. So, you know, be, be, be okay with, with going into that regard. Uh, did you talk with any of the Critical Role guests about how they spent the year of time skip from Scotty Knows? Uh, yes, I did. We actually met last night for, for about four or five hours going over all that. So that'll be coming up soon. So look forward to that. Um, let's, oh, wow, it's all exploding. So when I saw someone ask Triss or Yennefer, um, oh, man, I was a Triss girl until Wisher 3, and then... I began to lean in for a little bit, but I went back to Triss. I'm a Triss person through and through now, I think. I have, I, I mean, I'm marrying a redhead, so I feel like I'm a little biased. But I think Triss, you know, y Yennefer was a love that was built by magical force that eventually blossomed into an actual attraction, if you play it right. Triss, I felt, was a genuine attraction that came naturally. So that, to me, was something very important. And so I'm a, I'm a, I think I'm a Triss guy to answer that. I once said Yennefer, but that's changed since then. Um... As some things do. Uh, Hugh Miller C. asks, how do you want to do this? With alcohol. With alcohol. Uh, <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's get to some of the interesting. Uh, Cal Rowney asks, can we see more dwarves? Love their accent. Uh, I'd love that. I. I love the brogue, it's my favourite. Um, the the Scots dialect is one of my favourite ones to do. I enjoy it thoroughly. Uh, across the spectrum of even just soft Scots, which is more of the casual conversational type, I love that. It's more of a, it's got a, a nice, uh, almost uh, poetic lilt to it. I love speaking in it, I love hearing it. I love it, it's just, uh, it's my favourite way of doing it. Uh, usually when you think of a dwarf, you think more classic video game style and you know, World of Warcraft, hey, well, bring me to the orcs. But, for me, just the, the, the softer Scott is more nice too. The more refined and more uh, conversational type. I uh, love it. So uh, I would like to do that more, but only if dwarfs work in the story. And they are there throughout uh, many circumstances. Uh, let's see here. Favorite animated movie. I saw that go viral fast. Oh, man. Does Who Frame Roger Rabbit count? It's half animated. I'm going to say it works because it's one of my favorite movies of all time. And not only is it just a technical achievement and a narrative achievement, 
um, but such an amazing cast. One of the last big projects that Mel Blanc got to work on and actually do his Warner Brothers characters. Uh, it's just a it's a perfect film in so many ways. I, I love Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and uh, it w should and will never get remade because it, it's one of those films that only worked in that era and could never be made again. So I, that's definitely that's definitely it. Someone asked about uh, having another me person become a permanent member of Vox Machina or the campaign. I'm going to say no to that. Um, I mean, seven players is already a lot. Uh, and when Ash is not here, even six is a lot. Um, so I think we're good. We're solid with this number. Uh, six to seven players is good, and th that gives us enough room to occasionally have a guest. I feel like stretching the attention a bit. Um, I do want to have guests on occasionally to add their narrative and and to kind of mix it up a little bit, but uh, but no, I don't I don't think we're gonna bring another permanent member on, uh, in my opinion. It just it's a lot to concentrate on, and I'm already kind of stretched thin as it is. <laughs> Thank you for understanding. Um, have I ever been charged with a crime? No. Uh, I've been interrogated by police. Um, I <laughs> this is a funny story. Back in high school, I was uh, walking to my friend Todd Hunt's house uh, to go play riffs. I had my riffs character, my binder, my dice, and everything in a bag. And he lived not that far from my girlfriend at the time, Mira. And so I would, uh, on the way to dr walking to his house, I was going to stop by and say hi. Uh, but she wasn't home, apparently. And so I like, walked up, rang the doorbell, nobody there. I looked at the window to see if anyone was home. Went up and looked at her bedroom window, wasn't home. So I continued walking up to my friend Todd's place. About five, ten minutes later, a bunch of cop cars just pulled up, because apparently the cops were really bored in Agora Hills. And uh, they stopped me, and they were like, hey, so, uh, so what's going on? What, what, what you wandering in this... Uh, it's neighborhood four. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to visit my girlfriend, but she wasn't home, so I'm going to go with my friend Todd and play. I'm like, oh, really? Really? So it's in the bag. It's in the bag. I'm like, uh, it's my Lord Magus, OOC. Why? <laughs> so I hand him my character binder and my dice, and apparently I guess they got a call that there was a prowler with a bag of tools lurking around the house, one of the paranoid neighbors. Uh, but then I had the experience of them interrogating me over my character sheet and asking if there were any drugs on my dice and like smelling and licking them. And I was like, come on, guys. Oh, really? Okay, we good? We're good? He's like, yeah, okay. All right, go ahead. And I was like, thank you. I got my bag and I start walking on my friend Todd's house. He goes, I thought you were visiting your girlfriend. It's up the road, right? I'm like, well, I mean, she, no one was home. So, and I'm a terrible, I just get nervous anyway. Uh, so he's like, huh, well, if that's true, uh, I'll drive you. I'll drive you to go see your girlfriend. I'm like, uh, and I got really freaked out because my girlfriend's mom hated me at the time because I wasn't a doctor uh, or uh, from the Middle East. Uh, she, was, she was Lebanese. Um, uh, so I was like, oh God, this last thing I want is to all of a sudden have the police show up at the door with me and her mom's there. It's going to be terrible. Um, and thankfully she wasn't and the cop didn't really do it and everything was fine. But uh, that was my really nervous run-in with the police with my Rift came character. There you go. Just a little story there for you to take home. Oh, boy. <laughs> Question, am I going to Dragon Con this year? No, and I don't know if I'll ever be to Dragon Con again, because unfortunately it happens the same time as Burning Man every year. I went back in 2004 and 2005, where I cosplayed as Dan Hibiki uh, and uh, Mugatu from the first Zoolander, because that's what you do when you're at Dragon Con. Had a great time, but um, since Burning Man becomes a little more of a creative and spiritual retreat for me every year, that kind of takes precedence. So I don't know if I'll ever get back unless they change the weekend. But it's a lot of fun. I have a lot of friends that go. So have a good time. Uh, let's see here. That's another good question. Uh, Neb uh, Nezer asks, what's the story behind each of your bracelets? All right, this is interesting. And I've, I know people, I've seen people make fun of the fact that I wear these leather bracelets and like it's a fashion statement. It seems like so douchey and rock star like to wear. Um, and that fair play, uh, this was the first one I got right here. This is a magnet-based bracelet. And I received this actually at my first Burning Man. And this, to me, represents personal responsibility and uh, knowing where I come from. I'm, I, I come from a bloodline of alcoholics, and uh, my father also dealt with uh, his drug addiction. He was a musician in the 70s and 80s, and that went from, uh, he went to Narcotics Anonymous for a while. Uh, I'm just kind of open up here. Um, wonderful man. I love him to death. He was, and, and, and is, such a wonderful person. Um, but he dealt with uh, addiction issues. And so I knew, knowing I was predisposed to all of this, I avoided alcohol. Um, I avoided anything. I didn't even have my first drink until I was 23. I was so scared that I was predisposed. And as I began to know myself better as a person in my life, I decided I w knew that I, 
I felt that possibly I wasn't held by the same demons that my family before me did. And so I tried alcohol and was like, okay, yeah, this isn't, this might be socially a thing, but it's not for me. And so I'd occasionally have a drink socially, but it wasn't a big thing. And I felt that was, that was a big thing for me. And my first Burning Man, being surrounded by drug culture and having a lot of my judgments on uh, various experiences that I had friends who had and talked about. And I was like, uh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, that was my time to actually face those demons as well. And so uh, I had a number of experiences at the burn that year with friends and safe environment where I could try different uh, things, safe things. Um, but so I could ha speak with these from a, from a, a, a basis of understanding, um, safe hallucinogens, things like that in, in a very nice environment. And uh, the end of that week, I realized that I, I really firmly understood that I did, was not bound by the same demons of addiction that my father did and my grandfather before him. And I met a random person on my last day that week and we like just met at the edge of the trash fence, the far out in the middle of the desert. And I, we talked for two hours and I told them all about this history and they gave me this bracelet as a reminder that I overcame my family's demons and as a, as a reminder of the responsibility that I have to make sure that I stay true to myself and and try and help others to not befall the same traps. So that's that was where I got my first bracelet. And I wear it all the time. The second one I got, because Marisha made it for me on our first anniversary. Uh, she bought the leather, she dyed it herself, she punched it, and if you see in there a little bit, you can see coordinates that she pushed into the leather. And these coordinates um, are the uh, coordinates in the earth where we had our first kiss. This is a beach on PCH under the moonlight, because we've got to be cheesy and romantic and shit. Um, but she gave that to me as a reminder that night. And so that, that this bracelet to me is a reminder of her. And so I keep that with me at all times. This one was given to me by my best friend, Brittany Wallach, who I've known for over 10 years. And uh, she's just been a dear friend, a uh, confidant, and helped me get through a lot of hard times and been there for me. I know it's cheesy. I know it's fucking cheesy, but you ask, guys, sorry. Um, and uh, so, sh so this to me represents the friends and the people that I have that support me and help me through the hard times and are understanding when uh, you know, I just get busy or get sad. And, and so this, this one represents friendship uh, to me. And this one here was a gift from a critter during one of the crit misses. There's a little tree of life on it right there if you get a chance to see. Um, and this was important to me because uh, this represents you guys. This represents the community represents everyone that, that has come along with us on these adventures, the critical role, and uh, how you've changed my life in so many wonderful ways. And uh, so this, I wear this all the time because it reminds me of you guys and what we're doing and all this crazy silliness. So now you have the story behind my wristbands, probably the deepest explanation of them I've given to date. And I may have said too much about myself, but whatever, that's what this afternoon's about. There you go. <laughs> all right. The question, how did you and Marisha meet? Uh, we met, I'll try to make this a lot quicker than the last story. Me and Marisha met uh, through mutual friend, Becky Young, who was an actress friend of mine. She played Samus in my web series I did back in 2009, uh, 2008, 2009, called There Will Be Brawl, which if you haven't seen it, it's a silly live action kind of film noir crime drama of the Smash Brothers universe. Um, but she was doing improv, and in one of her improv classes, Marisha had just started doing improv, and so they became close friends and began doing uh, scene work and, and, and sketches together. And then Becky was going to create like a geeky sketch group for the internet. And so she called in a bunch of her friends to be writers and actors on it. And she called me in, Matt Key, and a few friends that she met through Brawl, and then brought Marisha over from her improv. And so we met at that first writing meeting and we both immediately crushed on each other, but we were both in the relationships and just like, nice to meet you. <sighs> and that was, you know, we just became loose friends. We met at a couple social events over the next year or so, but we, um, you know, we, we, we were just kind of this distant, oh, if only, but alas. Then about a year after that, we reconnected after not seeing each other for a while. Uh, I'll get to the tattoo in a minute. <coughs> and uh, I had gone in for a mocap audition and they wanted to know if they had any females that had dance experience and martial arts experience. And I was like, Marisha does. So I got her an audition there, and she called me to say thank you. Uh, if I make, you know, pay back to you with a drink sometime, I'm like, I'd love to. We never have actually had a chance to hang out one-on-one -on -one before. So we went and got a drink and just talked like four and a half hours, and we clicked. So it was, it was just an electric dinner. We both just, everything was perfect. I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. 
and I'd been out of a, out of my last relationship for about nine, ten months at this time, and had spent a period of time just being single, trying the dating thing. It was weird. I didn't like it, and I was kind of spending a lot of time solitary. And she was uh, just on the outskirts of a long-term relationship that had been kind of dead in the water for about six months, according to her. And so we went our own ways. And about a week later, she called me and was like, hey, I just broke up with my boyfriend. Uh, do you want to get a drink? I need to talk to somebody. I'm like, sure. And so we went out and got drinks again. And from there, we just began to hang out more. And it eventually turned into a romance. And the uh, rest is history. Now we're getting married in October, which is crazy. Uh, anyway. Tattoo. So I said the tattoo. So this this is my first tattoo, right there. This uh, this represents actually the art car of our Burning Man camp, the Sensatron 5000. It's a uh, <coughs> it's a triangular metallic platform built on a truck bed that has a large uh, an LED umbrella top that comes off top of it. It's hard to describe. Uh, if you do a search for Sensatron 5000 Burning Man, you might see a picture of it. It's these big sil colored silks that hang off of it. But anyway, this this tattoo is the, a geometric drawing of the art car, and uh, so it's just a little reminder of a little part of Burning Man home, uh, and a place where me and Marisha have had many great times together, and with a good kind of camp family out there. So that's what the tattoo means. Um, all right, now let's start getting onto the creature. Let's do some some fun stuff here. <coughs> so for the the creature for the encounter. Oh, actually, who owes more shoes? Me and Marisha? Marisha, I own like two pairs of shoes. And they're both busted. Actually, one's a little, little better. I replaced it not long ago, but I, I'm, not a, I'm not a clothing shoe person. These are the fanciest socks I own. Um, okay, so for the monster encounter, for the first bit here, I want to ask uh, this creature, uh, what, what size do we want this creature to be? Um, I'll uh, I'll throw the ones out. You guys don't have to, to put things in there because uh, it's kind of a limited course here. But uh, I'll go with tiny because it would be great than a really powerful, super tiny boss fight. Uh, medium, large, gargantuan, oh, and small. We'll say small as well. That's right. Small is there. So tiny, small, medium, large, uh, and uh, well, medium, large, and gargantuan. I think that's all. No, huge. Sorry, I missed huge. So we'll do tiny, medium, large, huge, and gargantuan. I don't think we need to worry about small, because if we're going to go tiny, go tiny, right? So those are the five. Tiny, medium, large, huge, gargantuan. We'll go ahead and throw that in the straw poll, and we'll see where that one ends up soon. So uh, that getting back to the questions here. Let's see. Uh, Martyr85 asks, when you get a rare chance to play, is there a personality trait you have that you purposely try to avoid while role-playing? Um, I try to avoid the Batman persona. I'm kind of like, I'm dark and broody, and I know everything, and I'm badass, and whenever anything story or emotional happens, I don't care. Uh, that I've, I don't want to play Drizzt Jordan. Basically, I've played with so many players over the years that all kind of fall into that archetype. Don't get me wrong, I love Drizzt as a character, but that set up that set up a, a, a precedent in the late 90s and early 2000s that most gamers, uh, god gamers at least, I, I gamed with, tended to lean in that sort of, you know, Bruce Willis action movie star type persona uh, that got a little ridiculous for a while. So I try and make things a little more kooky and try and run. I do tend to make my characters after the rest of the party has, so I can fill in the gap. You know, um, I'm a support player, I guess, in that regard. So I'll wait for everyone else to choose what they want, and I'll see what's missing, and then I'll go ahead and create something to fill that space. That's generally how I do it. And I recommend you do it, too. You might force you into some uncomfortable territory. You might end up playing a class that you normally wouldn't have chosen, but realize that was actually pretty fun and a lot cooler than I thought it would be. You can learn a lot that way. Just saying. What happened to the Asimar kids? We'll find out. Still in Whitestone, from what you guys know. Which, by the way, there's a lot of NPCs. A lot of NPCs in this world. I can't show them all, all the time. Uh, when they become relevant, they'll, they'll arrive. Or if the party searches them, they'll be, they'll be there. Maybe. But I, 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 yeah, there's a lot of characters that I've put in this world as I realized over time, and it's getting a little nuts. So, uh, sorry if one of your favorites hasn't showed up in a while. There's a big world. 
Fox Mike can only cover so much ground at any given point in time. Sorry. Uh, let's see here. Um, I'll be from, actually, do we have an answer on that one? Tiny. <laughs> Almost 99% tiny? I love you guys so much. I'm so excited for an extremely powerful tiny beast. I'm so excited for this. Oh my god. Oh, I was hoping you were going to say that. Okay, okay. So, a tiny creature. Now, type. Creature type. I'm going to have you guys throw some in the chat room. These, in, these include undead, monstrous, beast, uh, aberration, construct. You know, any of the classic monster manual creature types. Start throwing them in the chat, and I'll start pulling out the ones that seem to get more votes as we go. So, uh, yeah, fiends is one. Pixies, uh, fey. Um, let's see here. We'll throw Faye on there. Faye seems to have gotten a few votes. Um, Aberration. Aberration's getting a bunch of votes as well. Construct's getting a lot of votes. So we've got Faye, Aberration, Construct. Uh, uh, oh man, it's a lot of that. <laughs> Celestial. I'm seeing Celestial a lot in there. Um, and we'll say... Elemental. There we go. Those are, those are some five interesting choices. Those are the ones I've seen the most, at least. So, there we go. We have Fey. Uh, we have Construct, we have Elemental, we have Aberration, and what was the last one? Celestial. Celestial. There we go. So we'll get that straw poll going and we'll figure out what that is here in just a moment. I'm going to go ahead and pour a little port in here. Oh, look at that fine fire, that totally real fire. It's real, don't judge me. This is... <laughs> I have not had a drink on a Tuesday this early. At least not in a while. That wasn't a margarita. Um, okay. So, uh, I Am Virus asks, Skyrim or Witcher 3? Witcher 3. I love me some Elder Scrolls. I've played them all since Arena. But Witcher 3 all the way. I'm just saying. Uh, Deslog asks, question, wine, whiskey, or vodka? I would have said... I would have said vodka years ago, but I've come to enjoy whiskey more in recent years. That happens when your girlfriend's from Kentucky. And she brings bourbon into your life. Um, but even then, like, I'm not a, I'm not a heavy drinker, so, like, I'll, I need, like, one drink and probably be whiskey, probably mix with something. I'm a girly drinker. I want sweet shit. I, uh, I can enjoy a nice, straight, harsh liquor with, like, a sipping drink, but give me a mojito. Give me a margarita. Give me something nice and fruity and sweet. I'll, I'll, I'll deal with the headache. It'll be fine. Let's see. ZZZ195 asks, how do you deal with rejection? Oh man, not well at first. Uh, I remember when I was in seventh grade, because uh, I got rejected a lot. I had a very interesting upbringing, or at least a very interesting uh, childhood. Um, I had a lot of asking girls out whenever I got the, the courage and them saying yes on the spot and the next day going, actually no, uh, and that sucked. Um, I had a PE teacher named Mr. Pickett, who I just wouldn't get up and run the mile in seventh grade after the girl turned me down. Uh, a girl named, I think it was Jamie, in choir, or chorus. And uh, he was like, is it a girl? I'm like, yeah. He goes, it's okay, man. Women are fickle. Which is kind of a douchey thing to say now in hindsight, but at the time it helped. It pulled me out of my funk. And he gave me like a dude-to-dude -dude girl talk, and I was like, oh, right, I feel better. Um, rejection sucks, no matter what happens. But you have to remember, rejection is not because you are, you know, a lesser person. Much like an audition, like you just weren't the right person. Um, don't take a rejection, if it's from an individual you're asking out, as an offense or that they don't want to have anything to do with you. Sometimes it's just, ah, uh, you're not my, what I'm looking for, I don't know you well enough. Uh, and some great friendships I've seen come out of rejection from multiple sides. Um, but there is, there's a habit I've seen, a lot of this kind of uh, nice guy syndrome happen online where it's like, I will be a friend to a girl and the minute that I that she that I begin to ask her out and she says no, then like fuck her, and then it's it's an unhealthy uh, behavior because you're missing opportunities for great friendship, and two, she just wasn't into that aspect. At least not now. Give her time to get to know you better, or 
let it blossom into friendship and focus on somebody else might be more more your style. Um, as far as like uh, career rejection, just keep focused on the next venture. The more you obsess and concentrate on any sort of rejection or or falling um, uh, out of a, a prospective path, it's uh, it's you know it's hard. Um, but if you just focus on the next endeavor and try and be like, okay, that didn't work out. What can I focus on now? That only takes your mind off of it, but it already gets you in a better direction, focusing on what's right and, and, and what could be the next venture. Um, yeah. I had a lot of interesting experiences as a kid. Actually, I want to bring this up real fast because I feel like it's important. Um, I want to... Uh, I just want to ap apologize legitimately to anybody who felt uncomfortable from the the story, the last tearing episode and kind of revealed there. And I apologize because that, you know, if that hit too close to home, uh, if that was not the representation of your story that you wanted seen, um, and I understand that that it made a lot of people feel uncomfortable and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm legitimately sorry. Um, I put a post about it uh, on Twitter, but you know, text is easy to be misconstrued and you only have so much brain space to put out there. Um, and I'm sure I've been torn apart. I mean, that's fine. I, I, I admit that. However, I do want to say that I, th I think it's an important story to tell from what we understand of it. And when I say what we understand it, you know, we all come from different backgrounds. And, you know, and this is going to get a little real here for a second. Um, you know, you d we have our experiences to, to come from when it comes to story. Um, we as actors, we, we, we write and we only create from experience. And um, Xandria is very much an open uh, environment for the most part. People are, you know, sexuality is, is just an open thing in, in society. There are couples of all different walks of life, asexual, uh, you know, trans, non-binary, uh, gay, bi, everything. And it's all just kind of open in the world. Uh, is the world free of ignorance? No. That that's part of life and part of the story because you know people are flawed people are stupid it's nowhere near on it's a very it's minimized in my world because i i like to imagine a world where it it is largely minimized but it doesn't mean it's not going to exist um and what little bit of story of terry's story we've touched on it's a lot of it improvised by sam on the spot and a lot we've talked about it since then and we developed a little bit beforehand to an extent i think is an important story to tell um and parts of it resonate. Uh, people were concerned that we were making fun of his kind of a awakening or, or his his coming to terms with his venture in the last episode. And I, I can honestly say that, that that if it came across that way, I'm sorry. That is not the case. We are, we're very, very sensitive to these things. And many of us have lived very close to or dealt with homophobia on our end as well. You know, I grew up a very androgynous, long-haired, you know, pretty boy who was quiet, um, you know, and God knows I spent a number of years of my youth being called faggot and being pushed around and, you know, I've, you know, I have a lot of very, very important people in my life uh, who have dealt with far worse and have, you know, undergone a lot of terrible circumstances and I, I, I feel for that a lot. And, you know, like my, my Uncle Ted, for instance, um, one of the most impactful people in my life, probably at a young age. He was my, my dad's brother. He introduced me to musical theater. He introduced me to Andrew Lloyd Webber's Phantom of the Opera. He we used to play piano and sing songs around the piano and stuff. And he, he's, he's just such a wonderful person. And uh, as a kid, I, I loved him. He was my favorite uh, you know, relative on that side of the family. He also dealt with the difficulty of being married and having a child with his wife, and then one day coming to terms with the fact that he was gay. And it, it, you know, it sundered a lot of... of that part of the family at the time, and you know, it was, it was very hard to, to be in parts of the family that didn't understand that. And even as a kid, I knew what was wrong and what felt wrong and what was being said. And you know, and then get and I <laughs> and then had to watch him, you know, waste away over the years because uh, he. HIV and then AIDS, and at a time when it was very prominent in the late 80s and early 90s. 
then, you know, through the 90s, in, in a lot of ways, it was very hard for people of, of alternative sexualities because we didn't have communities. Uh, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have Tumblr. We didn't have Facebook. There weren't places you could go to feel safe um, if I your lifestyle was expected to be uh, not the norm or not accepted. And so I had a lot of friends and a lot of close people that had to just suffer inside and had nowhere to talk and occasionally meet somebody uh, or find somebody who's comfortable enough to be out and proud. And then it was permission was given, but even that was met with a lot of difficulty. And so like, it's, I'm glad we live in a world now com by comparison where things are much more uh, respected. And it's still a fight. God, it's still a fight. There's still so much to be done and it's still so much bullshit and so much disrespect and lack of empathy for people who just want to be happy. And that bothers me on a deep level and I feel really hard. Um, but... I know that parts of Terry's tale may not be the representation that some people hope for in media. Um, but I've tried my best to represent other happier lives and things where that was an open and a, a viable circumstance. Um, Terry's is important for people that grew up like maybe a lot of my friends did and didn't have that open, welcoming scenario. And... Uh, I'm doing this on the internet. Uh, um, anyway, uh, I'm sorry. I'm doing the best I can. And uh, not all stories are going to be for everybody. I can't please everybody with all the choices we make. And I misstep and I fail and I stumble. And even if a few people get offended, I can't help but feel bad because I hate hurting people. But I promise I'm doing my best. That's all. Uh, you know, when I said, you know, Terry's experience, uh, his scenario at the end of the last episode with, uh, you know, with Trish was reminded me of a lot of friends growing up, you know. You know, every, every person has a point in life where they struggle with their own identity. And uh, I had that too, you know. I identify as heterosexual. But, you know, I've had my years of curiosity. I've had my years of trying to figure out what it was that was in, you know, who I was. And, uh, you know, yeah, I, I myself am primarily attracted to women. But I, there are men that I've also found attractive in life. They're mostly about person, the individual. And, uh, you know, sometimes it, it takes an experience like what Terry had to finally feel confident in that, and in not a judgmental way. His was a little more comical, because it's Sam, and we want to play up the uncomfort, of the discomfort of a secret sometimes with humor to offset it, but we try and treat it with respect, because a lot of it plays to elements of our own lives or people that are close to us. Um, and so Terry's journey is, is in some ways still a personal one for myself, and other people in some ways. So just, you know, we're trying. Uh, anyway. Wow, that happened. Let's go to the next monster thing. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Ah. So Tiny, what type of monster are we doing, yo? Celestial. Celestial. Tiny Celestial. Tiny celestial encounter. That's going to be... Oh, I'm good. No pizza. Thank you. I got, I got popcorn and port, yo. In a fireplace. What more could you want? Um, ability score focus. What is this tiny celestial really good at? We're going to make this a six choice. A six choice. Uh, a straw poll here. So we're going to go ability focus. Of course, strength, dexterity, constitution... Intelligence, wisdom, charisma, the classics. I want to know what this tiny celestial is really damn good at. What is it really good at? So we're going to put that in there, have you guys vote, and we'll see just how nasty this thing can be. So pay attention to the chat. We'll have it up there in just a moment. We're going to go and do some more questions. And 
and I'll keep it together going forward. <laughs> Uh, Talisar, question, how excited are you for the new Bill Nye show? Uh, I actually, I've watched a few episodes of it. I'm conflicted. I love Bill Nye, and I grew up loving Bill Nye, and I, I am a firm believer in everything he has to say. I think, I think in some ways we're entering this weird era that uh, is undermining intellectualism and fact, and it's really frustrating, and I think he's been a great beacon for that in, in public spheres. Uh, the tone of his show is a little strange because I feel like it's a little preaching to the choir so far. I feel like I feel like it would be a better message to try and has th have this show present in a way that is speaking to the other side and explaining why it's important to listen to what the facts are, what the science is. The show so far, what I've seen, comes across a little preaching, a little condescending to those that may not believe, and I don't think that necessarily befits his argument in the best way. It's still a great show, and, and, I'm, and I'm liking it so far, but that, that would be my one critique on it, um, as I, f I feel it comes across a little, little self-righteous in a way that might turn off the people that really should be listening to it and learning from it. Uh, otherwise, it turns into kind of an echo chamber. Um, but I'm excited to check out the rest of it and hope that that picks up a little bit. Um, and I love everything he's done in the past, and I think it's important that we have more figures like that that are both uh, public figures like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye that are champions of science, champions of reason, champions of fact, uh, and I, I'm excited to see more of that type of content be created. So I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll see more of it. I will say the new Mystery Science Theater is fucking awesome. As a person that grew up watching like the original Comedy Central run when I was a kid and first moved out to California, uh, I'm a Joel guy. I love Mike, but Joel is my guy all the way, and I've watched every episode. I was so scared for the reboot. I was so scared because it could have gone wrong in so many ways. And I legitimately teared up multiple times watching the first episode of the new Netflix show because it felt like the old show to me. And I was so excited. And even like the final credit sequence, that they, they even have a new version of this, the old kind of sad orchestral version of the MST2K theme, and I was just like tears smiling. If you get the, I tend to cry a lot. I'm a sensitive boy, uh, <laughs> if you haven't figured that out by now. Um, let's see here. Do, uh, so we have... Ability score focus. Do we have an answer on that yet? Charisma. Was it? Charisma. Charisma. Well, this will be interesting. Okay. All right. So, I'm going to say, let's do three focuses here. And we're going to see this be a combat focus for the creature. So it's a tiny, celestial, charisma-based entity. Uh, do we want it to be uh, melee-focused? Not melee. I'm trying to be better about that. I grew up saying melee, and it's an old habit hard to break. I know it's melee. Uh, I'm trying, guys. No, it bothers a lot of you. Melee, or ranged, focused, or spell focused. Or you know what? Environment focused. So it might get in the fray with people. It might attack them from a distance. It might do a, s a spell uh, caster type. Or it might be focused on just using the environment to its advantage. So. We'll go ahead and throw those four choices up in the, uh, the poll, and we'll see what that one comes out to here in just a moment. <laughs> mm. All righty. Let's see. Ooh, we're gonna, well, an hour and a half goes fast, guys. Thanks for chilling as long as you have and watch me be ridiculous on camera with you for a while. <laughs> um, Scrubs fan 6 ask question, what's your favorite band? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, I guess my father was a musician. I was raised on you know, Beatles, Moody Blues, Steely Dan, Alan Parsons Project. So I come from that background. But then I also was introduced to great more uh, modern bands. During well, I say modern as a kid in the 90s, like uh, Stone Temple Pilots, Typo Negative. I uh, love Typo Negative. Uh, great pseudo, almost not serious goth rock. It's beautiful. Um, but I think the musician that's affected me the most would be Mike Patton and his work with Mr. Bungle. Many other musical projects he's done are fantastic. Phantomas, uh, Tomahawk, Lovage, um, and some of the solo stuff. But his work on Mr. Bungle was just so avant-garde and strange and, and kind of changed my perspective on music and vocals. He's my, he's my, oh, Gogo Bordello is a great choice too. Gogo Bordello is fantastic. Um, but, um, but no, Mike Patton's work has been heavily inspiring, heavily inspiring in so many ways. And, uh, He's probably the closest vocal, 
lo the closest I have as far as a, a vocal match when it comes to music. So uh, if there's anybody I can sing along with in the car, Mr. Bungle, I'm right there. And I, I have a secret dream that if ever I end up with too much time on my hands, that I'll I'll do a Mr. Bungle tribute band and like do a show once at the Roxy just for my friends. Like I want to do that one day. Will it ever happen? I don't know. But uh, yeah, my, my patent's my boy. Um, Strap holes up, guys. You got a boat. All right. Let's see. Uh, Lowell Keegan says, Matt, kind of stagnant in life with no direction. Do you have any friends uh, or were yourself like that? How did you find your direction or motivation or whatever? Yeah, uh, a number of times. Um, that's not an uncommon experience. If anything, take solace in the fact that all of us eventually find our place, ourselves there at some point or another. Um, before I went to Burning Man, I was in that place. Uh, out of out of school, I was in that place. Um, right before I met Marisha, to a certain extent, I was in that place too. Um, change of scenery helps more than you think. Being being stuck, stagnant, and being in a place of of comfort that is affiliated with that stagnation, in my opinion, can be a very stifling atmosphere without realizing it. I recommend taking a drive by yourself. Just drive. If you're near a coast, up the coast and find a bit of beach to just sit and talk for, or, or, or sit and think for a few hours on your own. Bring some snacks, bring some wine. Uh, or go into the desert or go into the woods and just commune a bit with just your surroundings. Go to a place that's outside of what's uh, normal and comfortable to you. Both just force yourself, force yourself out of your comfort zone, but just put you in a space where you can start thinking outside of the way you normally do. Um, I don't. I can't say that'll, that's a, a guaranteed uh, answer, but that can begin to help with forcing you to think outside of the normal. Woe is me! Uh, I can't do anything. I can't change anything. So you've already changed one thing. You've already changed your scenery. You've already discovered possibly a new place that you can go to for solace, a place you can bring a friend. Once you have these moments to think to yourself, um, and maybe try a hobby you've always wanted to, and never gave yourself the gumption to do it. If you're always like, I've always wanted to try sculpting. Do it. Buy some clay. Look on YouTube. There's so many great tutorials for anything you ever want to do ever, period, on the internet now. Um, so just buy some clay and start sculpting in your house. Or go to a class if, you someone, if there's one nearby that you can afford. Um, do some life drawing. Something artistic, something creative, something that, that, that spurs the brain outside of the numbers and mathematics and that may at least be enough of a change of your normal way of thinking that it might inspire different directions to look. It might get you right on the path or at least put you in that direction. There's no guarantee and there's no, you know, there's no right answer to this, but that's something that's worked for me. It's worked for some people I know. Um, and at the least there might be a start. I wish I had better answers for you, but I hope that helps. Um, all right. What's the answer on the straw poll? Environment. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I was kind of hoping you were going to say that. So, oh, that's going to be a fun, fucked up battle. Okay. And last but not least, let's get a name. I'm just going to, whatever first cool names come out of the chat, um, I'll go ahead and start pulling them, and we will put those into the straw poll, and uh, we'll base it off that. So don't be offended if I don't pick yours. I'm just going to grab ones that seem interesting and throw them up there. So let me look here for a second as you guys throw the chaos at me. Let's do, uh, oh man, Kayora, K-A-E-O-R-A. -E Let's do Balkanus, B-A-L-K-A-N-U-S. Yort, Y-O-R-T. Excelon, E-X-E-L-O-N. Ooh, I like that one. I'll get two more. Symphior. Like symphony, but uh, S-Y-M-P-H-I-O-R. And let's see, we're going celestial here, folks. Let's see. Lethes. L-E-T-H apostrophe E-S-S. Lethes. Oh, uh, Sim Symphior, I think it was. Uh, uh, you know, the symphony, S S M or S Y M P H I O R. 
and we'll put that in. I hope that's right. If it's not, that's what it is now. <laughs> um, so we'll get that started to air, and we'll start pulling through some answers on that. Um, and we'll see what that name comes to. Congratulations. Uh, and we'll see. What, oh, man. I've already got some ideas in this one. Now, these, these might not appear very soon in the arc, but they're going to be worked into the arc. It'll be a surprise to you guys as we'll be the player when they come in. Um, and we'll work this out. So it uh, should be fun. All right, we've got about 20 minutes here. I want to get some... Some more questions here. Uh, what instrument would you play from uh, Coastal One Kenobi? <clears throat> Funny, my father, a musician, played many instruments. Uh, I got a lot of instruments for Christmas over the years, messed with them for a day, and lost the interest and came from my to my little brother, who then became the musician. And so he plays trumpet, trombone, guitar, drums, piano, everything. Uh, I'm, so I'm, I'm bookended by extremely talented musicians, and I'm, all I do is sing. Uh, so I'm a little sheepish about instruments. Uh, I'm a decent drummer in rock band. I'm hovering in that hard to expert level, or at least I was in my heyday. Gotten a little rusty since then, I'm sure. Um, but if I could play, like really play, I'd probably go... <sighs> any instrument? Violin. I love the violin. It's such a beautiful instrument, such a beautiful sound that can invoke. So many just rich emotions like you can tell a story through just a note and i've had my my heart just tugged on and smashed and uplifted by just a single solo violin piece uh, it's a beautiful instrument and it takes a lot of practice and anyone who out there that plays violin like power to you all the love uh i don't have the, i don't have the time uh maybe one day maybe in my retirement i'll learn to play violin but uh, that's definitely probably my favorite instrument of all definitely um kung fu panzer asks how do you think this date is going? Are we going to see each other again? Does Marisha mind? Uh, date, I mean, I think, I think it's a great... It's probably going great until I emotionally spilled all over you. That's when you like retract and go, oh, okay, this guy's a bit much. He's got some baggage. Um, but we'll be good friends. And we'll probably hang out and get drinks. And I'll introduce you to Marisha. And we'll all go out and like wander at the CIA bar in North Hollywood probably and drink over a dead clown under glass. That's a real phrase about a real thing. You should look it up. It's terrifying. Um, let's see here. But ask booty uh, said, "Do you ever mow your lawn? Did you? I did. I said that earlier, but I just wanted to say your name out loud. So there you go. Congratulations." Um, question: Do I like camping? From uh, a simile, I love camping. I love it. I love it so much. I don't get to go anywhere near as often as I'd like. I think we're trying to plan a box mocking a group camping trip as soon as we all get time. Uh, because we all wanted to do that for a long time, and we're trying to find a weekend that works for. But I love camping. I went a lot with my family. We go up to uh, Mount Whitney, through all mountain ranges, up in Big Sur, and yeah, just camping was great. My mom was hilarious because she she loved to camp, but she also loved some amenities. She's the only person I ever knew that would come out in the morning and heat up her curling iron in the campfire to do her hair while camping. So my mom, I love her to death. But that was that's a memory I will. Always hold dear to my heart. <laughs> Just crouched down, dirty, heating up her curling iron. Yeah, she's awesome. Um, let me see. Interesting other questions. What music are you listening to at the moment? From Ponage Panda. Uh, a lot of churches, as you've probably seen from the shirt. Uh, every single tiny trickle of Lord that comes out, I obsess over and latch on to right now. Um, good EDM, I enjoy as, as a good, just kind of general creative space. I see good EDM because there's a lot of really shitty EDM. I briefly fell in love with the Chainsmokers and then quickly fell out of love with them after seeing interviews with the douche bros that are them. And, uh, uh, but like, it's a good EDM I really enjoy. Uh, classic Radiohead never dies. I mean, the Paranoid Android uh, era was fantastic. Um, Spotify's allowed me to go back and listen to a lot of old songs from my teen years that I hadn't had access to in a while, so that's pretty rad. But uh, we got really heavily into churches right around the time that me and Marisha got engaged, so the churches have been kind of our happy theme for a while, the most recent album. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of a recurring theme with us recently. Uh, let's see. Favorite sweet alcoholic beverage from Aqua Jolt? Uh, if we're going dancing, 
and I don't want to spend a lot of time drinking or spend a lot of money on multiple drinks, I'll just get a Long Island iced tea because you just need one and it gets the job done and you're ready to go dancing. Uh, if it's more of like a casual conversational, like we're all at like a small dive bar just talking for hours, I'll probably get like a, like a Kentucky Mule, like some bourbon ginger beer, a little bit of lime and just kind of sip on that for a while. Those are probably my two current favorites right now for utility purposes different, definitely. Uh, let me see. Question, worst video game I've ever played by Timmy32. Oh, man. Oh, what? There, there is some bad games. But, like, they're known to be bad. Uh, I worked on some bad games. Like, like, I worked on a bunch of Shrek titles. My job before I became a voice actor was I worked in QA uh, in the game development side and then worked into producing in game development. So I worked on worked with a company called TDK Media Active for a number of years and made Shrek licensed products that were terrible. Um, like Shrek, Shrek Party, uh, Mario Party ripoff that was Shrek related. That was really bad. Um, oh man, what are some really bad games? Uh, Fallout Brotherhood of Steel, the RT, like the sort of turn-based RTS they try to make as a Fallout fan who loved Fallout 1 and 2, that one just broke my heart because it was just not a good game. Um, for me, like, having a broken game is terrible, but having a broken game with a great license is even more painful. So that, that really kills me. Um, Hound Rider 9000, this is question, ever considered short hair? Yes, I don't look good with it. I don't think so, not for me. Long hair has been kind of my thing for most of my life. Longish, you know, I've, I've gone through stages, and you've seen it shorter sometimes in the show, because you gotta cut a little shorter and it eventually grows out. But I just don't look good with short hair. I feel, I feel cold and naked and alone. It's too short, and I don't like it. So uh, my hair will probably always be, in some degree, longish, or at least ragged, I guess. Um, Zenez8 says, favorite voice line. Which one bugs Marisha the most? Oh, favorite voice line? I mean, it is a gift. It is an absolute blessing that I've been given a, a, a catchphrase in McCree. That is, that's, I'm going to have that with me the rest of my days. And as much as you people might be like, oh my God, he's so annoyed to have to say it's high noon all the time. Like, no, that's, that's fantastic. And I'm always happy to say it if someone's very respectful about it. And I'd be like, hey, hey man, what time is it? Then I'd be like, all right, dude, relax. But like, that, that's wonderful. That, that's, a, that's, that's a catchphrase that, you, that very few people get that. So I, lo I love it. I'm, I'm really excited that I have that. I'd say that would probably be the most iconic quote that I have, character line. Bothers Marisha the most. Any of the McCready post-romance wake-up lines from Fallout 4. Because like we'll wake up in the morning, sun's just coming through our blinds in the bedroom, and she's starting to wake up, and I'll lean over and be like, so you ready to face the day? And she'll just punch me. Uh, rightly so. So I'll, I'll give her shit about that every now and then. <laughs> um... Playgrat Chansey question has is any tips on how to deal with players who fight over items and gold? Uh, <laughs> talk to them and say, guys, seriously, you need to work this out. Otherwise, we're not going to play. Like, be respectful and figure this out. If there's still a problem, maybe have them encounter some sort of an extremely powerful Archfey entity that is tr uh, true neutral and really feels that everything should be fair and has found interest in them and follows them silently and visibly. And if at any point they start fighting over loot, threatens them with complete and utter destruction. So be fair and play nice. Otherwise the Fae will destroy and consume you. Find story reasons to fuck with them and force them to play nice too. <laughs> um, curse items, also a great deal. That really greedy guy keeps grabbing everything, throw him a couple cursed items and let him deal like, oh, hey man, you took that first, put it on. Oh no, you're withering. Uh, so good on you for chat. That's, that's another great suggestion. Uh, communist Fey. Yes, exactly. <laughs> question. Star Wars or Star Trek and why? Interesting question. Um, I grew up loving fantasy. My fantasy is my jam. I should love Star Wars as much as the next person. And I enjoy Star Wars and I watch the trilogy a lot. But I wasn't as into it as a lot of kids that I knew. I had kids that had all the toys and the bed sheets and everything. But I was, I was a Tolkien kid. Um, and so me it was like either high fantasy or high fantasy in space. And to me, I just kind of more leaned high fantasy. Um, but I love I love the original trilogy. I watched it a bunch as a kid too. But you know, 
So when I, came, when I got into Star Trek, right around the Next Generation era, when that first came out, that was so radically different than anything I'd really gotten into that I immediately leaned towards that. So my, like, my very realistic, realistic sci-fi, Star Trek, you know, utopian society of the future, exploring the cosmos in a very just kind of colonizing uh, harmony type way, was so radically different than than any other sci-fi that I had really experienced outside of like Asimov and the Arthur C. Clarke books that I grew up with, uh, that I fell in love with that. So I, I definitely started more of a Star Trek person. I've come to enjoy Star Trek, or sorry, I'm more Star Trek person. I've come to enjoy Star Wars more as the years go on. Um, but I think Star Trek had more of an impact on my youth because I had Lord of the Rings as more of my fantasy and then I had Star Trek as more of my sci-fi. So Star Wars is kind of in the middle. I kind of adhered to the two extremes, if that makes any sense. Don't hate me on the internet. <laughs> it's too late. Uh, Phalanx 66 question, new tattoo? I do have some ideas. Um, when the campaign guide is over and out there, I'm talking with Marisha about it. I haven't decided yet, but I'm thinking about getting the outline of Tal'Dorei tattooed on my back. Just the outline of the continent. And with each campaign guide, if they keep happening, I'll add more continents until eventually I have all of Exandria on my back as just outlines. It's an idea I've had. It's an idea. Don't know if it's going to happen, but... You know, that was something that came up. Hmm. Um, let's see, let's pull some questions from the... Favorite action movie character, Hudson Hawk. Do you know who that is? You should watch it. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Nerd, I know, I know. And I own it. I should. Um... Favorite Doctor from Doctor Who from Fire Night 7. Oh, we got 10 minutes left. Thank you for the reminder. Favorite Doctor. Uh, I grew up on Baker, so he was my introduction to the world. Uh, Doctor Who was originally that weird British show that came out at like 5 a.m., which when I, when I couldn't sleep or I woke up way too early as a kid, I'd watch and be like, I don't know what's happening, but this is weird and awesome. So that was my introduction to, uh, uh, to, to Doctor Who was through Baker. And he was just a great Doctor. I loved his personality and his, his whimsy. He was just great. Um, and then it wasn't until the reboot that it came back, uh, that I got back into it, and Tenet won me over then. So uh, I, it's a close match between Baker and Tenet, but I think Tenet just wins out just a hair because he had so much, he ran a gamut, especially towards the end of his, his run. The, the sheer, the, the fury, the, the, the warrior doctor elements coming through, his, his sorrow, his loss, like, I can't, I can't watch his final walk to the TARDIS after he takes in the radiation uh, and his right before his generation without becoming a blubbering absence of non-sad emotion. It, I am an absolute mess. Uh, Mark Humes, actually, from High Rollers. I dragged him when I was in London years ago. I dragged him to the uh, Doctor Who Museum because he hates Doctor Who. And so I was like, you're coming with me because you're my host. And he hated it the whole time. It was just me and him and a bunch of kids, and it was amazing. Um, but they had the actual TARDIS console of the Tenet era TARDIS, and it was all busted up. And I was like, oh, cool, it's the console. And I hear this music, and I'm like, what's that music coming from? It's really sad. That's really familiar. And I look over, and I'm like, that's the song of the Ood. And they have a big screen that had Tenet walking through the snow, slowly making his way to the TARDIS, and I just start bawling. And I watch the whole sequence of them saying, I don't want to go, and then just tears everywhere. And I'm just, I'm blubbering, heaving, sobbing, a grown man in the middle of a Doctor Who museum amongst a bunch of kids that are confused, and Mark just with his arms crossed going like, fuck, I know, am I? It was amazing. Uh, I, I've dragged that guy through some shit. <laughs> uh, all right, so I'm trying to get through some of these questions fast because we got to close this up pretty soon. Um, let's see. Favorite non-RPG game by Zeta Michelle. That's hard. Almost all the games I like are RPGs. Um, Street Fighter. Actually, not that hard at all. Street Fighter. Street Fighter. I grew up playing Street Fighter. Hardcore. I used to, I did, for a brief time, I did tournament Street Fighter. And I can still hold my own pretty decently in Street Fighter. And there was a time where I was super, super intense about it. I got really good. My prime of my life was during the Alpha 3 era. Alpha 3, still to this day, is my game. Um, but, uh, like, I got really deeply into Street Fighter. Not just the competitive aspect, but the lore. There is Street Fighter lore. And it is confusing and contradicts itself a lot, but like I got really into it and I owned a bunch of the Japanese import art books that I could only get in Little Tokyo or order online at the time off eBay. Um, I did Akuma for Halloween one year. I've done Danny Biki multiple times. 
Uh, I learned a lot of the Japanese phrases. A lot of most Japanese that I know, I learned. There's very little I learned from fighting games. Mostly Street Fighter. So if I ever go to Japan, all I can really do is get in fights. Not as useful, but that is what it is. Um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a Street Fighter guy all the way. Let's see. Let's get to some more of these new questions at the bottom. Uh, oh man, let's see. Ghostly Muse, question, for players who want to have more variety, are there any resources you'd recommend for learning accents? Yes, watch the new episode of Signal Boost to have Liam O'Brien boost exactly what I'm about to tell you, but the IDEA, the International Dialects of English Archive, is a fantastic free website that has recordings of people from all over the world in all different countries uh, speaking in English, uh, reading a story that has all the phonetics and, and vowels and all the different ways you can say and pronounce things uh, as it's part of its construct, and then they talk about themselves. But it's a great resource for listening and learning uh, dialects and accents from all over the world if you're good at picking them up by ear. Otherwise, you might have to study a little more and get involved in the, in the uh, IPA, which is the International Phonetic Alphabet. That's a little more of an investment and probably more if you're going to go into acting. Um, but the IDEA is a great resource. Recommend it. Um, Zip, Zipnol, best dream you ever had? That I can see on there. Uh... Best dream only because it was so vivid. It wasn't a good dream. It was, it was a nightmare. But it was so vivid. And, and it was so... I, mean, I, I wrote a short story about it in high school, and I don't know where it went. But I had a dream that uh, I was walking home from school. <coughs> it was in high school. And the entire sky was just a, a roiling, gray, cloudy mass that was just dark and ominous. And it was shifting and moving. And occasionally, you'd see, like, a sky skull shape emerge out of it, or a giant skeletal hand reach out of it and then retract into the sky. And it was, there was just this sense, this, this, uh, just everyone kind of understood that this was, something very bad was going to happen. And so I went home to my family and my mom and I was like, you know, what's going on outside? Because we've seen the news. And we look at the news and as I look over the, the, uh, the monitor, I see this big cloud that was in there, I mean, this big mountain that was visible from our house, this giant kind of slow, Slowly uh, retracting uh, funnel was just making its way down, not like in a massive tornado way, but it was just slowly descending from the sky like it had deliberate intent to just land. We look at the news, and over in Japan, of course Japan, because that's where all cataclysm starts apparently, um, this giant obsidian orb, like a mile in diameter, just apparated. It was smooth, and they had the whole, you know, a bunch of different military forces were brought there to, to, to look at it, and no one knew what it did. Then one day a door beneath it opened. I mean, it sat there for like a week, and everyone was just like, what does this mean? The clouds are there, this is happening, but nothing's going on. And then suddenly we watch as this door retracted from underneath the orb and opened, and multitudes of these kind of demonic spirits began to spill out. Just thousands upon thousands upon thousands of them. They all looked like devilish entities, but they were spectral, and they could just pass, they, they couldn't be harmed, they passed through all physical matter. They didn't attack anyone. But what we began to discover is each one of these entities, these spiritual entities, had one corresponding person in the world that it knew where they were and was just going right for them. And whenever it found them, it just embraced the person and they died. And so it was this like extermination of the human race, with each one of these demonic spirits designed to find the one person that they were designed for to eliminate them. And it was this wave as it just went across all of Asia, then to Europe, and then made their way into the US. And the rest of the dream was just waiting for this to happen. And it was this very ominous kind of acceptance of the end and then looking out and seeing these waves of entities coming over the mountain that I, we started the dream with and then coming through the valley to the neighborhood and coming towards us and that's the last point I remember. Dark as fuck dream and I apologize for that but it was so vivid that it just the imagery to me I, I filled my sketchbook and I began to write a story about it and then like the imagery inspired me in certain ways since then and so that was probably one of my favorite dreams though not one of the best dreams one of my favorites. Um, okay we're we're having to close this up here because we're getting to the end of the six o'clock period here. Um, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for coming and hanging out today. Uh, we ran a gamut of emotions and thoughts, and we created a couple of NPCs and monsters uh, that was promised from a charity game a while back. So thank you for being patient with that. We're getting things geared up again. Uh, uh, but appreciate you guys so much. Thank you for listening, hanging with me, hanging with my awesome fake fire. Um, and I hope you have yourself a wonderful day. I'll see you guys Thursday for the continuation of Vox Machina's adventures. And uh, is it Thursday yet? In the meantime... Some of us will see you uh, talk smoking in about an hour or so. Take care.